right guys welcome back to real talk with sir scoots let me bring you up in volume here now let's talk about evil geniuses uh where we last left off kind of in your professional career you were at mlg they offered you a position in new york and uh, you opted to kind of do your own thing so before really meeting you, you knew alex prior to that but what what did you do kind of in the interim between uh mlg slash got frag and team evil geniuses um well i had to uh you know part of leaving got frag there was a non-compete um so I had to sit out and non-compete for a while. I was able to get them to drop it a couple months early on me. But basically, I, I, I kind of chilled. Um, I went back and did a little bit of my event logistics job. Because by, by the time we finished at Gothrag TV and I left, it had become full-time. I was on salary. I was on benefits with MLG, like the, the, the hierarchy of Gothrag's executives and even some of the lower below us staff. We were all getting paid. Um, so I had given up. So my clientele, again, I've always kept Coca-Cola, but I kind of got off the road, right, when it went from kind of getting paid by Gotfrey to fully getting paid because it's only a fair thing to do. Um, so I, I got back on the road, did a couple gigs, um, and, and kind of much like I, I, I did and am doing now is like I sat back and went, okay, I love this shit. This is part of what I am. Like this isn't a fad for me caring about competitive gaming and pro gaming and um, so I did a lot of reflection like, okay, well, I've worked with a huge media company, so to speak, in my world, got frag. Um, and now MLG, I've seen behind the curtain of a league um, and how they operate, big city New York business, you know, Grand Central Station offices, you know, and I literally sat down and like, okay, now, uh, you know, what do I want to do next? You know, and like, that's why I giggled with you earlier. There are a couple guys on Reddit in the question thread. I was like, ah, good riddance. It's like, I don't know where the fuck they think I'm going because <laughs> I'm not going anywhere, right? Um, so I just, I, I sat and like, okay, what, where, what's the next slice, right? I'm all about learning shit. And, and the, the event business is all about different sides of it. You learn the food and beverage side of it. And you learn the transportation side of it and the airline side of it and the contract side of it. The VI, there's all different like departments right within a meeting, uh, and so I take this very much like that. I was like, okay, well, fuck. I did streaming. We did. We nailed Gotfry TV. Really proud of that shit. That was cool. Uh, we got sold. Really cool of that. Made some money. Blah blah blah. What next? You know. And at that point, the next, you know, I look at this whole thing as a triangle, and I'll explain in a second. But the next thing to me that I hadn't really, on a professional level, been involved in was a team, you know, because UGP is not that. It was never about sponsors and money in a business. Um, but to me, like, sports and, and esports are a triangle, right? You've got the league or the organizing body, whatever the sport is. You've got the media over here because media has got to cover it. And over here you've got the players and all of those, or team if it's, not, if it's not a team sport. And in the middle of that triangle is the fan base, right? They touch everything. Everything touches everything. That is kind of our world, right? And obviously, marketing dollars come in from different sides, et cetera. So I looked at that and went, oh, well, fuck. I don't know what I want to do, you know? I tune into a show on Complexities Network called Live on 3. And it's DJ Wheat has left, you know, in the meantime of me leaving Got Frag. Same time CGS takes a fucking crash and burn and is done, like fucking history. Um, so DJ Wheat's out of a job. Everybody's basically out of a job. Little Alice Garfield's out of a job. Um, so I'm hanging out, and I listen to this show, and it's Marcus and the first couple episodes, because Rod wasn't there, I think, and then Rod's on the show. And I'm like, fuck these guys. This show's called Live on 3. None of them are Counter Strike fans. This is bullshit. These Quakers need me, right? And I can, and I'm like, this guy, I can be my, I can be the loud, obnoxious, opinionated scoots. This is fucking perfect. So I reach out to Marcus, and I'm like, hey, Marcus, um, you know, you looking for anybody else on the show? You know, um, and for us, live on three had nothing to do with three of us being on the show. It's live on three is a term that you start a Counter Strike match with. Happy coincidence. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just happened to work out that way. And I'm like, hey, you know, and he's, and he's, and he's like, fuck, dude, yes. You know, and, and Marcus and I were able to work like once or twice some one-off events that as Gotfry TV, I was able to hire him to come kind of be a weekend caster. And I've, I've just always, even before I really knew him, and especially before I knew him as a friend, like 
idolize the guy at ITG, at GGL. Just his ability to take any game and entertain you and properly dictate it and not stumble over his own words and um and ah uh, and like things that people take for granted. Wheat does so much better than literally anybody else on the planet when it comes to gaming. Um, anyway, so the fact that I could be on a show with this guy that I, I, I kind of idolized and really wanted to work with uh, was cool. And Rod, you know, bless his heart, yell and scream at him. I think he's a great guy too. I still do, even though we fought about all sorts of shit. I, I, I still have deep love for Rod. Um, if he called me and he was in trouble, I would do whatever I can for him, um, regardless of what I think about some of his journalistic shit that he's done lately. <laughs> but anyway, um, so Marcus is like, fuck yeah, let me ask Rod. Mar Rod's like, fuck yeah, we need a counter striker because we don't fucking know about, you know. Because again, back then it was less about talking about every single match of every single tournament and more about big picture stuff. So what big was happening in counter strike? What big was happening in Quake? And we would... You know, it was a much more of an opinion podcast than it was a Sports Center news podcast, which is what it kind of is nowadays. So uh, he said yes. I reached out to Lee. I said, Lee, can I get out of my non compete a couple months early? I want to be on this show. I'm not making any money. It doesn't compete with you, blah, blah, blah. He reaches out to the boss of the B. I think at that point it was still Bromberg. Bromberg's like, yeah, I don't give a shit. Um, so I can get on the show early. Um, and I do. And. Uh, that, the rest of history when it comes to live on three, uh, obviously I've recently left that too. But that then leads to Alice Garfield tuning in one day. And, and throughout my friendship with Alice, and again, remember, he's the first one that kind of tapped me and said, hey, come help me at Gotfrag. I never did. But while I'm at Gotfrag, he is running this Canadian Counter-Strike team eventually, right? He takes over for this guy named Ocean who kind of rips off some of the players, allegedly takes some money and disappears into the sunset. Uh... Alex is friends with Stevenson, who is their Canadian opera, one of their superstars, and reaches out to Alex and says, hey, can you help me? You know, we're fucked. We don't have any money for CPL. And Alex starts the process of becoming the owner slash manager, sponsor, knock-on-door guy for Evil Geniuses, Canadian Counter-Strike team, right? So during this whole thing, and I'm a guy frag, he's always like, Scott, will you come help me? Scott, come work for God. Come on. Leave God frag. Come help me at EG. <laughs> To, to put it in perspective, at that point, he's running the fifth, sixth top team in the nation. You know, he's he's got Canadian – he is, like, probably the top Canadian team, although there's another one giving him a run for his money. But he's behind 3D. He's behind complexity. In some regards, he's behind NOA and rival in regards to monies and sponsors. And none of them are getting rich, right? They're just not. Players are not – they're getting flown around. They're not making hardly any money, et cetera. So, for years, when he asked me, I just laugh at him. I'm like, dude, you're asking me to leave working for, like, ESPN to go work for, like, a shitty baseball team. Why? 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 And he would laugh, and he'd go, okay, well, one fucking day, maybe, you know? Uh, and I would, like, he would show me his PowerPoint presentation, and I would go, okay, well, think about, you know, I, I give a little bit of help. I give a lot of guys a little bit of help. I still do. But nothing very in depth at all, you know, but he always teased me about it, always. Um, so fast forward, CGS collapses, and, and, and what happened with EG is really, really kind of his own lightning in a bottle, right? So he, he lets EG's Counter-Strike team leave uh, and become the Carolina Core Counter-Strike source team. So he loses his biggest bread and butter team as a negative to the EG brand, right? And he ends up being an assistant GM for uh, Jason Lake and the, uh, the, the LA team, the Complexity, uh, during all this, right? But he still kept EG on the side. Uh, he recruits different counter-strikers, because again, uh, not only has his superstar team left, Stevenson, Black Panther, all these guys are now CGS players, but all the top team counter-strikers have left. 3D is gone. Complexity is gone. Pandemic's team is now the Carolina core. Like, this this opportunity, this open door to Alex Garfield opens, right? Doesn't help him with Counter-Strike, because obviously all the best technically are playing this terrible game. But it opens up a sponsor opportunity that he would have never gotten, probably. Because none of those teams, especially, rival, uh, especially 3D and Complexity, uh, could take any of their sponsors with them. 
they were supposed to be able to eventually sell their own team sponsorships. And I think Lake has said a few times that that's one of the things that pissed him off. He never got an opportunity to sell his brand. He had to just deal with whatever CGS gave him. So that leave that left <clears throat> excuse me, that left Alex the opportunity to go knock on all their old sponsors' doors and go, Hey, I still have an independent brand here in town. You know, I'm not locked into CGS. But Alex kind of was doing both. He was involved in CGS so he could see how that monster was working, help his business sense. I think he got paid a little bit of money from his complexity, etc. But he was able to keep his independent team going separate from that. And slowly but surely was building it up and taking taking sponsors, so to speak, that were waiting to give their money to somebody else because they weren't going to give it to CGS, right? So he hears me on the show. He reaches back out to me in his typical, like, smarmy way with me, like, hey, so, um, Scoots, just curious. Now that you don't have a fucking job, how about now you come help me? I'm a pretty big deal. You know, and at that point, it would be safe to say that he had the largest independent North American team. Again, this is pre-StarCraft 2. This is pre-explosion that, that the world is experiencing now. We were a Counter-Strike team, uh, Quake players, wow. Uh, he had just signed Grubby to play Warcraft 3, him, Ciara, and Happy, but it was still like the house that Counter-Strike was kind of building, right? Um, and and to, a, to a lesser extent, actually, but a greater extent, uh, Azale and the WoW team were building because they were still incredibly popular. So I'm like, yeah, what do you got in mind? You know, um, and the landscape of EG's management looked nothing like it looks today. Simple as that. Um, so there was a far greater need for a guy like me than there is now, right? And that I'm sure you're going to ask me about some of this stuff of why I left, etc. But like when I joined, like Alex was in need of serious adult help. And no offense to those that were around him, but a good boss, CEO, manager, whatever you want to call it, needs to surround himself with equally as smart people, if not smarter in the areas he wants them. And then he has to be able to trust them in that. Um, and he just didn't have a whole lot of staff. You know, he had a web staff. They were doing all right. Brian Dunn, great guy, overworked. But, again, not the machine that you see as EG now or the business, right? So we all ju I jumped in. What can I help with? You know, I had many titles. I started as managing director. I ended up actually being CEO for a while because he took a step away. Um, and then finally ended up at COO. Um, and, uh, and again, same kind of thing with Got Frag. I approached Alex the exact same way I approached Lee in Midway. Uh, you don't have a lot of money right now. I don't, I can afford not to take your money right now, but I need something. If you want me to come bust my ass and wear, you know, wear your colors to, to bleed blue for you, just like I said with Got Frag, I want to come build it, but I want a piece of it. So if I help build something, I got something. And, and, and that's the deal I made with Alex. So I came in as a part owner. And again, for years, none of us were getting paid. Not me, not Alex, not anyone below us, certainly. Except for some players, right? Again, it's got to be players first. Got to be. Um, and again, much like Gofrag, was able to be part of a business that was able to grow to not only take really good care of the players in the, in the, in the stable, but start taking care of management and worker staff below management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think I ended up with Alex and EG for three, three and a half years, somewhere in there. I think I officially Sounds joined in right. 2009. Kind of going back to the uh, the CGS era, I, I guess is the best way to put it. I've always heard the remarks when it comes to Alex that everyone went to everyone went to CGS, and like you said, he kind of scooped up everything else. And they always say it in, in a condescending way yeah do you think that there's any merit to that or do you think what alex did was just smart and they're all just jealous <laughs> um no because i he, you know he gets a bad rap because some of the things that went down the day people threw him under the bus and it, like I'll, and I'll use jason like like jason and i are friends again but for a lot of years jason like and i were not friends we were not sociable we were not chattable like um uh, but like one of the things that really put Alex in a negative way is when CGS folded, Alex signed the old complexity Counter-Strike source roster away, and I'm going to rabbit your quote this, away from Jason Lake. And away meaning 
that Jason Lake could not make them a final an a financial offer, did not have them under any sort of contract, was cutting them to the wind and hoping they would stick around while he tried to rebuild his business, whereas Alex Garfield walked in and said, I'm willing to pay you right now this, this, and this, and give you travel budget of this, this, and this. Do you want to come? Players who had just moved to L.A., who then had their dreams shattered, are not going to sit around and wait on a guy who maybe in their minds are part of the reasons their dream was shattered, right? If you ask those complexity players, they had no love for Jason Lake. So there was no stealing the players from Jason. Alex put himself in a magical position for the simple fact he never closed EG. If he would have closed EG when Stevenson left, then he would have probably pursued a music career and stayed out of esports. I don't think, because EG didn't sell their brand to CGS, I don't think he would have come back and fired it back up, right? So I think for Alex, very much right place, right time. And did he play both worlds? Yeah, but I don't think he deceived a soul. You know, and the unfortunate thing about Jason is if you ask him now, and he's admitted that now, you know, within the last couple of years, that he fucked that up. He, because he literally came out and he was, a, you know, a, he was a, a popular, he, EG's a popular brand, right? But he was a popular positive brand, right? Fan base wise, right? Less negative, more positive. So when he came out and said, Alex Garfield did this and he did that and fuck that guy. Well, the community just latched right onto it. And they're both really good guys. And Alex didn't dick Lake, but Lake threw him under the bus. Years later, Lake unthrew him under the bus and apologized to him and et cetera, et cetera. But again, it's much like that page one story and the page 12 retraction a week later, right? People don't read the page 12 one. So I think through nothing that unfortunately Garfield did, like for a lot of counter strikers and a lot of people in, in that little window of time, he fucked Lake, he fucked complexity. You know what? But, but you know, I know what we paid fraud. I know how, we, how well we traveled that team. And we took care of that roster just as good, if not better, than Complexity ever did, even when they were taking care of that roster with CGS's money. So it's unfortunate, right? But that, that kind of started the, ah, oh, crazy little Jew Garfield, you know? And he gets a bad rap, you know? Um, uh, and I think, I think part of the reason he gets a bad rap is for years he just wouldn't talk. He wouldn't give interviews. Yeah, that's he didn't. True. Like, and I told him that. I told him that during that one years ago. I'm like, why are you not ripping Lake to shreds? Why are you not proving that you didn't fuck anybody? And he's like, ah, oh, Scott, it's just not worth it. I'm like, dude, it's absolutely worth it to protect your integrity. And he's a very, and it's taken me years to even get him to do an interview. Right? Um, he's just a very quiet, like not public facing guy right which is what i did for a lot of years for eg as well right um but i've always thought that he should have like ripped ripped lake right back like how fucking dare you dude because they both had points but they like he was he was being painted in a way that was inaccurate and that's unfortunate um and again now they've they've mended the fences you know um and it's so funny like we, we you talk about like this whole thing about embargoes, and, and we'll, I want I definitely want to talk about that whole thing with, with Alex and, and, and Rod, but Gotfrag got embargoed, which is really the wrong word. Embargo happens before you're supposed to release. Like if I put an embargo on this press release, that means on June 1st you can you, – it's unembargoed and you can talk about the game. But what, what Alex was talking about was boycotting Rod. That's not an embargo. That's boycott, right? <laughs> right. Um, kind of different. Uh, an embargo is, hey, Rod, we're announcing Stefano. Here's all the details. You write it up. It's embargoed till this date. So everyone's throwing around the wrong words anyway. But years and years and years and years ago, Gottfried and Midway in particular and, and, and Bootman and Weenus used to do these Gottfried playbooks that were insanely accurate. you know, And they would take uh, – you know replays and demos and all this stuff of a team and they would rip their strats down. Okay, on Dust 2, Complexity's pistol rounds are usually this, this, or this. Their save rounds, they go deagles and they tend to push B. And we had stats with game sense to back this shit up with statistical probabilities, right? They were really fucking good playbooks. Really, really good playbooks. To the point that teams would get so pissed off that they wouldn't give us interviews because they felt we were giving an unfair advantage to other teams. And Complexity was the first one to do it to us. We announced a playbook for them, and it was before a big event, 
Duh, why would you give a playbook out for teams that aren't going to compete for three months? Duh. Jason Lake thought we were personally like out to get him. So, and the playbook was good, right? It was a good, solid playbook. <laughs> Literally forbid interviews. Alchemist and I were traveling, forgot Frank TV. We were going to do video, audio streaming interviews from this little land center in Chicago that was a qualifier for Code 5 or something. We show up. And complexity is there, and they, it's their birth to win. Like, they are the team to beat. So the, the story of the weekend is going to be, can anyone take this birth away from complexity, right? And fucking fraud walks in the door with Warden, and I'm like, hey, we'd love to get you guys on, you know, interview, chit-chat with you. You know, we're doing this thing over here. We're going to do some audio stuff. And he, Danny's like, Scott, love to, can't be talking to you. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Can't be talking to me. I'm here to, to advertise for you. I'm the press. What do you – and I, again, same thing I was talking about. What the fuck do you mean? You, I flew all the way here, two of us, to, to cover your team? I'm sorry, dude. The guy that signed my paycheck said that because of this playbook bullshit and they're all mad at Midway that we can't talk to you. No interviews for Goffrag. All we can say to you is no comment all weekend long. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to ask you questions all weekend long, Fraud, after every one of your victories, just so you know. And I did, and he no commented me all weekend long. You know? And again, I, I, I got mad at Jason. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You realize that Goffrag's here, and we're here, and we talk about complexity, and we film them. This helps your players. This helps you. Uh, really, the... It, are you really that worried that the playbook, like your team's going to lose because of the playbook? So, but I got his point. He was like, he did exactly what fucking um, kind of, he took, the, he took the same action that Alex is talking about. He's like, fine, if you don't want to work with us, if you want to technically sabotage what we think is good for us, then we're not going to talk to you anymore. Right? It didn't last that long. I think it was one or two events. And, you know, he was basically slapping Gottfrag. And Alchemist and I had just kind of laughed and went, all right, well, our, just jo our job got 12 times easier because now I don't have to worry about, you know, interviewing complexity. And, of course, they won the thing. No one beat them. I asked him. He no commented. Warden no commented. We all, the players laughed about it. But even they got that it was kind of a disservice to them at the end of the day, you know, um, because – uh, like I think it was Warden was like, dude, if someone studies that playbook and we lose because of that, then fuck us, you know. And that was the player's point. And I get Jason's, you know, um, but it, it was just kind of weird, like just how like full circle, right? <laughs> I personally at this point have no animosity towards like for a lot of years I did, um, and I think that's public to a lot of people that were around that scene. He was one of the guys that I would rage on the forums about, you know. Um, I think he made a lot of the same mistakes, and I think if you ask him now, in the first complexity, that Faraz made in Quantic, um, with wasting and spending his own money, trying to beat the teams of the day, like all Lake wanted to do back then was beat the fuck out of 3D. Not just in-game, but so he spent towards that goal. And that's not how you build a business. You build a business the, organically, and if you build it right, well, then you're competing with the 3Ds. And that's no different than what Faraz tried to do with us uh, and Team Liquid. He wanted to instantly spend to be at the same table. And it cost him, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of his and his, sponsor, and his sponsors and his investors' money. Lake did that long before anyone knew how to spell Quantic, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so back to Alex. So... I think he gets a bum rap. Now, if you talk about some of the things he's done in the scene since I've been at EG, you know, uh, I think anyone who's had conversations with Alex knows that he kind of operates on a cerebral level different than a lot of people, right? Definitely different than me. Um, so that, that affects how he relates to his business, how he relates to other people, whether they're his peers, his sponsors. Um, and I think in some regard, one of the reasons I think he wanted me next to him was to be his devil's advocate, to be that guy on the forums, but in private, right? To go, Alex, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Um, don't know. Don't know about this, you know. Um, his foil, if you will. Because, again, if you surround yourself with the exact same like-minded people, doesn't mean you're going to make the right decisions. You're just going to make a unified decision, right? Um, so, Yeah. That's 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 my nutshell with little Garfield. Uh, I call him little Garfield. <laughs> I, I hate that. Um, I think he gets a far worse rap than he deserves 
but I also know him far beyond what the world sees. So, um, you know, I'm biased in that sense. I think if everyone knew him like I did, or maybe you did, then they'd also perceive him differently. Uh, but the, it is what it is. You you are perceived as you publicly project. I am, he is. So, um, that, that that is what it is there. Let's talk a little bit about some, I, I guess, some more current day stuff with with StarCraft II um, in, in in relation to EG. For a while there, my understanding was that you were somewhat of a player handler. Is, is that true to any extent? Oh, definitely. Um, again, when I first joined EG, you know, it was um, it was a couple guys doing content, um, and fuck, a couple guys doing content, and Brian Dunn trying to be editor in chief yeah. and and player management guy, and he's the guy that filmed you when you did the EG stand-ups, right? So he was... Right. And again, he's kind of everything. Was, but uh, yeah. everyone was everything back then, you know? Yeah, because again, you can't afford to send a guy to an event back then just to keep an eye on your players, and another guy with another guy holding the microphone just to be cameras and video. Like, So he was kind of their jack-of-all-trades. Um, one of the main reasons Alex brought me in is he... Uh, had hit the wall with actually dealing with players and being that guy, right? Because he was that guy. Um, and players, I don't care what game, um, are a very unique, um, for the most part, a very egotistical, uh, unique brand of human, right? And I don't say egotistical in a negative way at all. <laughs> it's the same thing if you're a pro or you're at the top of your discipline and everything, you're going to have a healthy ego about it, right? You're just going to, or you should. I have a healthy ego. I do. Do I come off egotistical? I don't know. I'm just not timid or shy or self con uh, uh. So I think a lot of pro players are very much full of bravado, right? And I think Alex just hit the wall with dealing with that, right? Because they want, 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 want. And that's their job, right? They're, they're, they're not there necessarily to care where EG is going to be in 10 years or think about the business of it. They want what's best for them and generally what's best for them right in that moment. Not all, not all players think that way, but a good chunk do. And I would too. My window is limited, right? As a pro player, whatever game, get it when you fucking can. Right? So he had hit the wall, right? And I, and one of the, the team that needed the most management at that time that was traveling the most was the biggest, Pain in the ass is the wrong word. They were just the biggest everything for EG in the sense of needs and, and, and hours that you needed to invest was the Counter-Strike team. I'm a Counter-Strike guy. So that was instantly what I started doing was dealing with players and contracts and travel. And again, I'm an event logistic guy. So I was the one making sure we had our hotels and making sure we had our hotel you know, travel booked and did the players have their passes and all, where are the new shirts? Does fraud need a new headset? Like all of that uh, very much – managing director or general like again everything kind of player facing went through me um and alex then was able to not worry about fraud or jordan nothing gilbert's contract renegotiation and he could worry about what he does best and that's knocking on the money doors and 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 explaining this world that we live in and getting marketing companies and sponsor reps excited about the world of pro gaming and obviously excited about EG within it. Um, and it worked out great, you know, yin and yang, because that's the la I, I can talk about this shit, as you know, till the cows come home, but you make me go into a boardroom and, like, flip through slides and, and talk numbers and statistics and, like, like, there's a difference between talking about it and naturally selling what you love and having to, like, close a deal. I'm not that guy, right? I am not the closer. Um, no desire, never been, not me, right? Uh, I'm going to get you to drink the Kool-Aid. He's going to get you to buy the Kool-Aid, right? Um, so, yeah, huge player management. That's what I did. Traveled with the Counter-Strike team, uh, traveled with Grubby to China, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and as we grew as a business, we were able to put people below us, him and I. So on the sponsor end, you see a guy like Colin um, Lecter show up, who becomes literally his right-hand man, handling sponsor sales, then sponsor activations, then his own accounts, who now has ascended to, I believe, and I, I, I think he's COO now. I think he has the chief operating title because he literally, his job now touches everything. 
from sponsors to the media made for sponsor stuff to the players doing stuff for sponsors. Like he's kind of he's kind of doing it all, right? Um, so Alex got help on the sponsorship side. Then we buy Loaded, another team, which gives us a great guy by the name of Brandon, who again, huge. He ran a whole thing by himself with staff for a while too. Well, he slides right into also helping with sales decks and cold calls and all those kind of things. So you got a core that's doing nothing but selling the product, and we slowly build a core that operates the product, right? So there's a guy that's Stu, the guy named Stu Ewan is with us for a while, who basically is our first legitimate general manager. Um, way over his head, way over his head when it comes to everything we ask him to do. Um, Brian Dunn moves to more of just a content role. Um, uh, Stuart moves to more of a player management role. And then, like, I ascend a little higher, right, uh, above that day-to-day -day stuff. So then I'm picking and choosing what events to go to. Stuart goes to a lot of the other ones I don't want to go to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which then leads, Stuart ends up leaving. Uh, Lucas comes in, Colby, who's been doing a lot of content for us. He comes in with the StarCraft team, kind of. And we decide that that whole growing brood, because uh, you know, again, we kind of grabbed a whole brood war crew, uh, the media's right. team. And I think a well, lot of people forgot about that as well, that you guys yeah. grabbed LZ Gamer, Machine, and Control. Louder, Louder. Nyokin. Yeah. Uh, you know, long kind of before. Yeah, long before, again, we all saw it, We all saw StarCraft II coming, yep. um, and we'd missed the, the Brood War boat. There really wasn't one anymore in the sense of lots of events for a foreigner to go to unless you were superstar. So it was never worth Alex's time to, to invest late to StarCraft. But, you know, why not grab these guys? They're not going to cost anything yet. There's nowhere to travel. They're certainly not ask for salaries. So that gives us Lucas, who transitions into – basically being the general manager for just StarCraft and then doing content. He's now transitioned to a full-on editor-in-chief role. Brian Dunn has left us. Goes to trolling, obviously. Avoli joins us, um, becomes a real deal general manager. Um, you know, and, and again, it, like, one of, the, one of the weirdest things about my time at Gofrag was it, for a while there, and I'm sure it pissed off everybody else, and it even pissed me off sometimes, everyone thought that, like, I was EG. Because Scoots goes to events, Scoots is the one doing the interviews because I can do them like there's nobody business, and and that was intentional. Like I was the public guy for EG, the spokesperson, but it got really frustrating to take all the credit for EG for a while because I knew that it I was the one making the least amount of decisions sometimes on some of the stuff because of the Alexes, the Collins, the Brandons, the Codys, the Lucases. Like there's a huge army below Alex and I at at, at this time, right? And I'm the one that gets all the credit. And I'm also the one that gets all the heat, right? Because I'm the that's that's the nature of being the public mouth of an organization, right? Um, so I was getting credit for shit that I shouldn't have got credit for, and I was certainly getting heat for shit that maybe also wasn't my decision, right? Because again, uh, it nothing is done in a vacuum with EG. Like Alex is the majority owner, so Alex does have final say on everything, right? Did Alex and I have tooth and nail fights, and he won arguments, and I'm going to sit here and go, I wish we never did that. Nope, not really, because every decision that he was heavier in favor of or I was that whatever decision we made, we made as a company and as a business. And again, I don't live with regrets in my life, and I certainly don't live uh, with regrets with, with my time at EG or Gottfrag. Are there things that I look back and go, okay, we could have done that differently, but I don't, I don't sit here and go, oh, fuck, I wish we never did that. Because again, everything in life, everything you do in life, everything happens for a reason. And the reaction to that thing is for a reason. Good, bad, indifferent. And that's a very karma-like thing to, like, to, to resolve yourself to. But that's just where I am, you know. Um, so uh, I saw Gottfried grow from Alex and I and a bunch of really passionate people to, frankly, a real deal fucking business, right, uh, in, in about three and a half years. Um, and... It was just literally, you were going to ask me why I left now. That sounds so great, Scott. And for me, it gets back to that challenge thing, right? I did what Alex wanted me to help him do, and then some in that sense. It, not that we had a checklist, but like I joined an EG in 2009 that is absolutely not the behemoth before you now. Good, bad, or indifferent, whether you like the team or not, I don't even fucking care. It is not the same beast. And I'm very, very proud of that. Um, but 
with all these other people doing stuff, uh, it left me with less to do um, and, frankly, less of a challenge, right? Um, so it took, it, it took me a while, but I finally went to Alex and said, you know, I think it's time for me to bail. You know, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't have a challenge. Um, you know, and as I said on, on the podcasts, um, I, I, like, Live on 3 became a chore in keeping up with news to talk about. And that's not the show I joined, right? I joined an opinionated podcast with three guys shooting the shit about the topics of the week. What that show has turned into, um, by virtue of the fan base kind of wanting it, is having to talk about every top game. More of a sports center, right? Like I said, less about big issues that you spend an hour talking about and delving into, and more about in this week's GSL, and in this week's this, and in Dota over here, and League over here, and what happened in Quake today. And so it was less us giving our opinions, which is why I wanted to be on the show. I'm not a, I'm not a journalist. Never, ever, ever claim to be a journalist. I was an opinionated podcast show host, and my opinion comes from years of experience doing this, this, and this. And that's, but for me to just chime in every week on, oh, yeah, that match with Squirtle, that was fantastic. Oh, yeah, I, I caught the Counter-Strike, Nip played really well. It, that just lost all excitement for me. Doesn't mean there's not a place for that show, and doesn't mean it's not live on three, but not why I wanted to be on the show, right? Uh, um, so that led to me wanting to get out of that. Again, I want to watch shit I want to watch. Um, and I just felt like I was doing homework for the show, um, which in a way led to me going, you know, I'm kind of doing homework for EEG. And again, I was getting, you know, that's a business and I'm an owner of that business, so to speak. So it was less of a, of a dilution of my spirit, so to speak. But I'm a big believer that if you have the opportunity in life to do what you want to do whenever you can, you do that, you know, and if you take a hit, like if you don't work for six months, but you can afford to do that, to find that next spark, then you do that. And uh, and the spark, I had moved on, right? Uh, EG, great shit. Like, I'll never work for another pro gaming team. I don't think I have no desire to. Did it. Check it off. Helped, helped Got Frag, helped MLG, helped the team. Now what's next in this pie for me, you know? And it, maybe it's every four years I get an itch. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But it was a perfect time to, to, for, to make a transition. You know, uh, I don't want to say Alex doesn't need me anymore, but frankly, Alex doesn't need me anymore. He really, in my heart of hearts, you know, as I said on Live on 3, I would not leave the business if I didn't think it was in amazingly capable hands. And it is, you know. Um, and, 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 and I even said, like, Alex has this. And again, it's not just Alex. That's what people need to understand. These, all these top teams have one or two people that you talk to, that you interface with, that you know, but generally a shitload of people below them that are busting their ass just as hard as not harder than that guy in the spotlight to actually make the business run. Um, and it, it's actually really encouraging to see guys like Colin fire their Twitter back up. Um, and obviously goes to trolling. Cody is uh, already out in the, in the public, you know, as, as who he is, but it's not, and it's nice to see Alex give interviews and whether, you know, you go on podcasts and you say the wrong shit and you're going to get grief, but damn it, <laughs> you need to get on those podcasts. And we, and we had these, uh, we had these conversations in my kitchen for years. Like Alex, this is your team way more than it's my team, not only financially, but just in spirit, this is your thing. You need to get out there. And I think, Two years ago, you never saw him, right? And now you slowly see him. He's he's doing some of these congresses. He obviously got that Forbes thing, but he's, but he has to do that. Like this is his baby to trumpet, not just mine, right? Um, and I think as people hear him more and get to know him more, maybe some of this um, this shellac exterior that everyone thinks he has maybe maybe fades away a little bit. You know, um, you know, he's got an air of. I don't know if pompous is the word. I, I don't know what the word is, but I like I, I watched his his inside the game, and I, I got I, I got some cringe going. I was like, oh no, Alex, no, 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 stop, hang up, stop, stop talking right now, you know. Um, but he has to go through this. You have to get you have to get publicly blessed and publicly you know fucking tarnished. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. 
I, I I've lost your question like twelve hours ago now. But anyway, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Going back to uh, to uh, I just want maybe not the inside story, but I don't. Maybe there's not even a story. But in terms of player management, was was there? And I think you know probably what I'm getting at when I ask this. But was there a specific player that you ever had issues with, or maybe had problems managing that? At that time, obviously, the player probably worked on that or didn't work on that. But was there anyone that just gave you a problem when, when you were handling yeah. that with NEG? Um, and again, I, I, I'm not going to blame individual players. I think if you put them on a pedestal, then you put them on that pedestal and you have to, you have to cater to what you've helped create, right? Um, and, you know, and issues with Counter-Strike players that all thought they should earn more money. Or travel to events that made no economic sense for the for the for the team to do. Um, yeah, I mean, and again, I, I think this 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 came out of a question about Huck. If I if I understand if I remember from the Reddit original thread, um, Huck is no Huck is no harder to manage or easier to manage than anybody else. Sometimes, right? It it. It depends on the player. It depends on his mood in that day. And when it comes to Hawk in particular, I'm technically and I technically was never his manager. So the, the question was phrased: how, did, how is it to manage him? I didn't manage him. Cody managed him. So uh, you know, Hawk and I were never talking about airline tickets or his hotel room or his gear. Like so, I never managed that at, at that point. Any of the players, as I was leaving, were not. It, you know, in the sense of day-to-day -day stuff, that was that's Cody's job. He manages the players. Poor guy, probably doesn't get enough money in the world. Uh, Hawk, in particular, you know, um, I think the way, the way the question was phrased, like, was there a regret there? No, there's no regret to signing Huck, and there's really no regret to to signing Huck with the money we paid him, right? And this is where it gets really, really weird for for people in the know versus people out of the know. Okay. Um, Everyone talks about return on investment. Is something re worth the return on investment? Oh my God, that's not worth the ROI. Oh my God, is this worth the ROI? Right? The only people that can ever, ever answer that question are the people that are involved in the ROI and they know what the figure is. That's it. So a couple weeks ago when everyone on the Pulse was pontificating if foreign team houses were worth the ROI, when none of them know exactly what a team house costs the teams they're debating is incredibly disingenuous to have any logic for the debate, right? ROI is all about the investment. If you don't know what it costs, you don't know if the return's worth it, right? So Huck, life-changing salary, right? So obviously a shitload of money. Could we have gotten Huck cheaper? I don't know. If we couldn't have got him cheaper, would it have been better to not have him and have that money elsewhere is often the question asked. But what po people don't understand is oftentimes when you're also going after big ticket players is you go talk to your sponsors, right? So let's just say, and we're going to use a hypothetical. Let's say we pay Huck, paid Huck $200,000 a year. I'm going to use a hypothetical, right? But if Alex went to sponsors in the world of EG and said, hey, or you shouldn't get in Huck. You pay us all this right now. But if you all give us a little bit more, we can get Huck. <laughs> Are you all game? And if they all say yes, then that, that costed you nothing. Because that was money you didn't have if you didn't go after that player. Right? So the return on investment is between EG and all the sponsors. Do I think we've gotten our money's worth out of Huck in regards to his victories? Well, that's such an unknown. You know, he won a DreamHack, he won an MLG early in his in his ML in his EG life, right? Long ago, hasn't performed well lately. But again, like that, the the money to pay Huck might only be in our budget because we went and talked to our sponsors about paying Huck. Right, so it's not as easy as going. Well, if we didn't have this guy, we could have these five guys. It just doesn't always work that way, right? So again, um, could we have nickel and diamond and got Huck cheaper? I don't know. You know, uh, not worth it, right? We got it for what we got. Um, 
it, and, and same thing, you know, same thing with re-signs and first signs. So do I wish, here's what I wish. Do I wish we would have got a lot more, because one thing you can't ever contract in, if you will, is wins, right? I mean, you just want to win. You want to do well. Can't guarantee it. Can't force it. But I wish we would have done a lot more with Chris as a player, right? I think the guys in the lair and the video crew, et cetera, have done a really good job with a lot of players with non-play-in-the-game content. And for all sorts of reasons, we haven't seen a lot of that from Chris, right? He doesn't live in the lair. Uh, you know, when he's in the lair, maybe the video crew wasn't in the lair. But that's, you know, could we have gotten even more ROI out of this big spend? Sure. But that's always the case. So no regrets with Chris. You know, um, it is what it is. Now, when you get to some of the stuff he's done behavior-wise, managing, you know, I've had Counter-Strike guys say stupid shit in interviews. I've had Quake guys say stupid shit and wear the wrong – like, they all – they're all not perfect, right? They're just not, you know? Do I wish that Huck wouldn't tweet some of the shit he does when it puts the team in a bad light? Do I wish that he would go, oh, this is the team that pays all my bills. Maybe I should delete, 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 delete. Yeah. Uh, did I fire back at him a couple times to try to get that message him in a public way? Like, hey, bro. Yeah. Did I reach out and get him fined or anything? No, I don't give a yeah, fuck. That's Cody's job, you know. Um, but, you know, you do wish, again, I learned very early at the Frag days that players care about players first and whose shirt they're wearing second, right? And that's not a negative. That's a fucking sports thing, right? Uh, you, you, like Alex's job, Cody's job, my job was at EG to build – player loyalty so that you never they never want to go and that contract negotiations are easy and that so they know that you are going to take care of them better than anyone you want to build that trust you can't force it and you can't expect it right so you can't get mad when a co player's contracts up and he goes negotiating and he uses you against them and he leaves you you really as long as it's done in a proper as proper as our world is uh you know, scenario, you can't blame a player for going after what's best for the player, right? So oftentimes these players are tweeting and they're mad and their frustrations are very much about shit that's making their lives harder, playing the game or practicing, etc. So their, their frustration is out of a really good place. It's just the delivery method is maybe misguided. Um, but again, young adults making lots of money, um, and you see it in sports, right? Guy signs a super million dollar contract and he does some silly shit. Goes into a nightclub with a gun. And these are like these athletes make these mistakes, and they're paying people millions of dollars directly around them to keep an eye on them. Their agents, their publicists, their management is all you know even more directly concerned about that player's image than EG would be, right? And those players still fuck it up, right? So you gotta expect a Chris to 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 sow his wild oats a little bit. Stefano to do something stupid. Now, what I will tell you that, you know, one of the reasons that I got a little tired of the team grind is having to worry about that, right? And that's that it, that's the nature of having that business, right? If you own a restaurant, you're worried that your food's going to go fucking bad before you can sell it. When you own a team, you're worried about what your players do. Not only in server, are they going to win, are they going to lose, but like their BM, their behavior, you know, and it, I'm not going to lie, man, it gets really old when you wake up and the first thing you're worried about is going to a website <laughs> to see what a player might have said or did, right? And I, I, and that's not against EG or, or those particular players. That's the nature of running a business where your asset is somebody else, right? And they're going to do great shit by you, but they're going to put their foot in their mouth. They're going to say stupid shit. Um, and it, it just got really, you know, it got, it, that got to be a grind for me, you know, because again, I'm a much older guy. And again, I've also put my foot in my mouth and said shit that I regret. I do regret some things in life, but like I accept them when I do it. Right. But I tend to, I tend to hold people accountable for their own actions and less who they represent. Right. But when you start seeing, and this is not just EG, but when you start seeing, you know, sponsors getting emailed or threats of sponsors getting emailed over some pretty silly shit, you know, and it, 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 it just, it, it just makes you go, oh, hmm, you know, and, and again, I had the wherewithal to go, 
you know what? Time for something different. You know, and again, I got no problem with Huck representing EG, and that by virtue represents me. A okay, bro. But it doesn't mean it's one of the greatest things in the world when you're waking up and you go, wait, Stefano did what? Wait, in control oh. did what? And but again, that's not EG. That's team management, and that is that is that nut. Be ready. You know, to because again, you take the good when they win. You're on the top of the fucking world, and you have to take all the bad in a slump. Being an asshole, giving bad interviews, wearing the wrong headset, and I was just I was like, you know what? I want to get back to me representing me, and what I do as a reflection on me, and to a lesser extent, anyone else, if that makes sense. Um, and teams—that's just the nature of a team, right? I mean, that's the same as sports team. You know, I'm sure there's sports GMs that wake up with. You know, football teams or whatever and go, okay, did any of my guys get in a fight in a nightclub? Okay, uh, what's up here? You know, it's just the nature of it. Um, so, yeah, Huck, you know, all I can say on the Huck thing is good on Huck. Huck was able to negotiate with EG to get that salary. It is what it is. You know, good on him. And, again, only EG and those directly involved know if they feel that that was worth the price. I think it was. You know, I wish I wish he wasn't in a slump for his own good, you know, um, but you know, that just is what it is. When it comes to kind of, I guess, internally dealing with uh, some of these outspoken players, is it is it what everyone kind of imagines where they're basically just fine and they go on the next day just doing their daily lives? Or is there more of a sit down and talk or did you guys kind of give them guidance on how they need to be acting in the public eye or, or anything like that when it comes to handling the players? Um, I mean, I can speak to my part of these conversations because obviously, again, Cody and Alex um, definitely deal um, with those day-to-day -day things. You know, if Huck tweets something right now, th they would be the ones that would be like, okay, hmm. You know, <laughs> how do we um, do this? I would see the tweet and I would go to Cody and go, what do you think about this? You know, and and again, Cody is the guy that that's his baby, right? He has to earn the respect of the players, so he's in charge of the fighting system and the, or the not fighting system. And I imagine that number one, five seconds after the player tweets, they already know it. These these are not stupid individuals we're dealing with here. So when Chris tweets, when now maybe. A few of those jokey tweets that Stefano had or the in-game stuff that when he was joking with, who was it, Todd or whoever he was joking with. Sure. I, I don't think he, five minutes away, went, oh, fuck, Cody's going to see this. Like it, Because in his, that was a different things, right? But I'm sure when Huck pushes the buttons, he knows he's doing that, right? Um, I think Cody probably the first couple times sits him down and goes, hey, man, really, this is why you don't do this. What, if you got a problem, you come to me. In public, what what is this, what does achieve other than you're making your team look not so good? Uh, that does no good. Like if you think you're putting pressure on us, Chris, to make your stream better, you're not. All you're doing is making yourself look bad for those that are giving you life-altering money. So I, I think it's it's a fine system for sure. Um, and and again, and again, you hope to grow them. You like when and when I have conversations with them, it might be a month later. Like like I. I like I went to like I went to the lair two weeks ago, right, uh, to grab some stuff and chit chat. Obviously, I don't run the team anymore. They don't owe me any sort of respect like that. But the lair is all still my baby, so to speak. I pay the bills, etc. But anyway, um, so I roll in there. I'm chit chat, catching up with everybody, um, and seeing how Jeff and his leg and everything are. And the day before. Greg and Jeff had both done some snarky tweets about the Lair's internet going down, right? And they're they're having some issues with Cox. I don't fucking know. For six months, it was perfect, and now uh, I call it PebCAC, which is problem exists between keyboard and chair, <laughs> and not the internet because I'm on the same service and the shit never goes down. But but they never torrent and they never download shit they're not supposed to download. And they all use virus protection. But anyway, none of those things. Anyway, so I looked, I, I laughed at Greg, and I go, so that tweet. Because he tweeted something snarky like, oh, yeah, fucking layer internet. You know? And so I, t I asked him, like, so did you get in trouble for that one? And he's like, oh, not yet. Not yet, but probably will. You know, so my tone with, with reprimanding them has always been 
even more, even before like a Cody was more like that cool uncle guy, like dudes, you shouldn't be fucking doing this. Jordan, why are you not wearing the right shirt? You know how stupid that is? Not so much like, Jordan Gilbert, on this day in October, you were not wearing, so therefore, like more of like, dude, do you, like trying to, teach is the wrong word, but like educate, like dude, you know, like, what the fuck? You understand the problem with this. If Kim Rom sees that you're wearing this headset and he calls Alex, you've met Kim Rom. You fucking understand what's going to go down, bro. And then Jordan goes, oh, fuck, bro. So you kind of you teach him that way, right? Now, Cody, how Cody handles it at this point, Cody might just go, like, the, the, the Skype to, to Huck at this point might just be a fucking dollar sign. I have no idea, right? Um, I don't know. You know, my gig has always been trying to make them better human beings and as they grow up, because this might be the first job for them. This might be uh, the first time away from home and all those kind of things, you know. Uh, they're not always world travelers till they start doing this a lot. So I always thought my gig was to make them just better at this stuff. You know, I can't help them be a better Counter-Strike player. Can't, certainly can't make them be a better StarCrafter. But I can explain better ways to get through airports and how to, now how to get ripped off on cabs and, like, life lessons, if you will, as they travel the world. <laughs> You uh, you touched on something that I'm gonna. I, I'm curious. I guess is the best way to, uh, to sure. hit on this. You said he paid the bills for the lair still. Obviously, you're yeah. no longer with uh, EG. Uh, are they are they gonna take that over? Or do, I mean, yeah, what's, well, what's going well, on with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let me clarify. Um, when I pay the bills, they then get reimbursed. It's just everything's in my name, right? Um, the lair is here, obviously, in Phoenix because we had a few players that were already living here. Idra moved in with Machine and Inca long before we thought about doing anything. So we had a core set of players that were already here, living dirt cheap. We thought it was a good idea to do a house. We had a studio here where we were flying guys in to do remote shit. Um, I'm in a market that lets you have very nice property at a very low rate because of the housing market crash years ago. So it just made sense to do Phoenix, right? If I wasn't here, there would they, we wouldn't even have done a team house probably. But it, it just made perfect sense. So when I approached Alex and said, let's do a team house, you know, we can get great square footage at a really good price. Um, got guys already in Phoenix. Great airport. You know, yeah, it's a boring city. It's a big spread out metropolis. Phoenix is not like San Fran or L.A. or New York, but it <laughs> doesn't cost like that either, right? So as a business, to open a lair where you're housing people and they fly somewhere, great place. So anyway, the we, and this, again, gets back to this ROI discussion, right? When Rotterdam tells me that the EG lair is not worth the ROI because in controls never fucking won a thing, I just fucking start laughing. And here's some real fucking talk. The evil genius lair costs evil geniuses $36,000 a year to operate. $36,000 a year to operate. Do you know how small that is in the operating yearly budget of Evil Geniuses? Let's just say really fucking small. Really fucking small. And the reason we did it, the internet's fine, by the way, sub. I'm not going to blame Cox. <laughs> anyway, and, and the reason it's that cheap is, one, it's Phoenix. You know, so the rent, because basically EG pays the rent. And we did it differently than everybody else. The, the Lair residents pay utilities. They all split the utility costs of the house, and they all split food. So EG does not subsidize for food, and EG does not subsidize for power, electricity, utility, right? What, we, what EG does do is if Huck comes for a month or uh, some staff is there and part of their deal is EG pays, then EG covers a piece of the pie, right? So if, if non-Lair residents have lived there for two of them for a month practicing, then the pie gets split by even more people and EG covers part of it, right? Because that makes sense, right? If, if Stefano's there, Greg shouldn't have to pay his, chair, his part of the electricity bill. That should come out of EG's because EG at that point is putting them there. You know, he's not there willfully. Now, keep in mind, uh, what the players have then done is they've they've rented a they, they now have their own maid service. They went from cleaning it themselves to deciding <laughs> fuck that shit. We'll just get our own maid service. Of course. Um, and you know they all go shopping together and they do pitch it on foods. I imagine that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, what does that cost the player? That costs the player. Greg pays somewhere between one hundred and fifty and two hundred and fifty a month. That's fucking nothing to live where they live to get what they get. 
right? Um, and again, it's 250 when the AC has to crank all summer long, and it's 150 in the middle of winter when no electricity is being used hardly but the computers, right? So it fluctuates. But 250 to live where he lives, to have the amenities, dirt fucking cheap, right? Um, and then their food's on top of it. Um, it's, and, and we made that deal with them from the get-go. They're all totally cool with it. And part of the reason I, I decided that, that's my idea, is I wanted them to learn a little bit of life skills, right? Because, for one, that 250 is something that Greg negotiates against, so to speak. So, again, we're paying his rent. It's in his contract that he gets X amount of dollars a month. Well, Greg's done his own math, right, to what he needs to live on and what he wants us to pay. So, technically, we're still paying it because we're paying him a salary to exist for EG. Um, but what I wanted to do was kind of, again, some of these guys never lived outside of their own homes before or even their parents' house. So, I'm like... Let's have them learn some life skills. Let's have them learn about roommates not doing dishes and having dish night and all these kind of things, right? And again, they finally decided that like vacuuming and mopping and all those things, because the house has to be kind of film ready for the most part, because they do film a lot there. They just all decided, fuck it. Let's just chip in and pay for a maid service. And they all added that to their price. They all decided they wanted to watch. Enough of them decided they wanted real TV in the lair because they're sports fans and they wanted to watch the Seahawks in different sports. So they upgraded and got Cox TV. Again, still costing them in the in the sense of what it costs me to live in this house, my own house, it, nothing, right? How much does it cost for where you live? You have roommates. You're in an apartment. These guys are in a fucking little dinky mansion, right? And they're not jammed in five to a room, you know? A lot of things, like the Koreans don't, like the food, for example, like a lot of people are like, why don't you cook for them? Fuck, they cook for them in Korea. Koreans all have chefs for a lot of reasons, right? A lot more people in a building in a lot smaller kitchen, right? Um, so they need to do mealtime in a much more strict, you know, Greg used to tell me if he didn't wake up in time for Slayer's breakfast, he didn't get fucking Slayer's breakfast because when you are when you have to feed a small little army, well, you have to do it in a much more regimented way. Okay, we're going to feed you from 9 to 11, and then we're going to start prepping for lunch, and then we're going to prep for dinner because we're feeding 20, 15 kids in a much smaller kitchen, you know. Um, so we just never went down that route, you know. And, again, they could hire some sort of chefy guy to come in and cook for them, but I, I don't think they care. I, I think – I think the visitors care more about not having food hand delivered to them, in the sense of meal structure, than the residents at this point. You know, they've all become better cooks, um, and I would say they all became better cleaners for a while, but now they've outsourced that. But again, look at the financials of that. So you got a layer that costs you as a business thirty six grand a year, right? You've got staff staying there. You've got players staying there. You've got players that can go in and out of there when they need to to get over jet lag or to create shit. That is the cheapest fucking team house on the fucking planet. So when I get – and I love Roddy, but when Kevin says shit like, well, since In Control and Idra don't win, it's just not worth the investment. That house would be worth thirty six grand a year if not a single player lived there and if it was just staff cranking shit out. Again, very much unlike everybody else, right? Um that's my thought on the house. So back to costs, the bills are in my name, so I pay them. And like again, I just figured out January's bills for everybody because we're about you know about December I think just finished. So I'll start getting January's bills. I figure it all out. Cody tells me, and when I was more involved, I would know which non-residents were there, and I figure out okay, what does EG need to pay for this split, and what is Greg's portion and Idra's portion? You know, Greg is Idra, obviously. And I send them all an email. Go, hey. Guys, this month you do this, here's my PayPal. And they pay me every month. So that's what I mean by I pay it. I manage the payment process of all the bills. Um, and, and I think it works really well. I don't think you get any of the players that would say, I can't believe I had to pay 250 to live here. Um, and, and again, it works out for both sides. So we've, we've, we've done the team house model, but on a, on a, on a kind of player-compensated way, which makes sense to me. It's not Korea. It doesn't have to be done like Korea. That's my take on that, and on our particular house. Uh, and, and, and again, to answer your question, why I pay the layer bills. So I guess my next question is, with you no longer at EG, is there a reason to have the house in Phoenix? Um, I think as long as they keep using the studio space that's also here, because again, like I had already left EG. We wrapped up Master's Cup here. Um, 
I, I guess it's up to Alex and Colin and those guys to decide what if they want to keep making content here. Um, because again, the lair is here because the studio is kind of here, right? And they went hand sure. in hand. Um, so uh, I don't know. You know, uh, the lease is fairly easy to get out of. We have a great owner. So uh, you know, if they if they decide to move it. Um, that might make sense too. Anywhere they go, it's going to be more expensive. It doesn't mean it doesn't make sense to move it somewhere else. You know, a lot more of the the corporate crew of EG has um, meandered to San Francisco. You know, Alex is now in in the city. Uh, Cody is close to him as well. I don't think they're actually. I don't think they're both in the mission, but I think he's out in the burbs. But um, you know, a lot of a lot of business is done in San Fran. I could see, I could see the house being moved. I could see the house being closed. Right, and something else opening in the city that's more of a quasi office for the for the management and staff for content slash some player stuff slash a studio. I think more of a, a hybrid of what this is. Um, Are those the only two it, options for it, or is is there a third um, of it still just staying in Phoenix? Um, I guess it could still be in Phoenix, but again, with me having very much a less day to day, and I've told them, you know, hey. You know, studio, whatever, we can keep pushing buttons over here. Doesn't hurt me, doesn't matter. I mean, they they came over and were here wrapping up, you know, because, again, a lot of people behind the scenes knew I was leaving EG long before the public did. Sure. Um, and, and, they, and they were coming to my house every night. Not a big deal to me. It's not like there's no animosity here. I didn't, I didn't give them all the big fuck you, I'm out. I just want to go do something different. Um, so I don't know. You know, that's, that's totally up to Alex and, and that crew to decide. If they go, hey, we're closing it up. And they need my help in closing the lair with leases and closing down, you know, utilities and all that. So be it. You know, they'll pay more for a space in San Fran, but it doesn't mean it's not for them now the right decision, right? It's been here for about a year and a half, and I think it's been a fantastic, good spend of EG money. Um, will it always be here with me having less and less involvement? I think eventually it goes somewhere else. I know the players don't love living in Phoenix. I know the staff don't love it here because – you know, they're kind of in a, in a North Scottsdale kind of area. Um, their demographic is not in that area, you know. Um, I think they all want to be near a hip, cool city. If they lived closer to Tempe and the, and the fun, young city of Phoenix, you know, Tempe's where ASU is, I think they'd probably have a different take on the fun of Phoenix. But, you know, that's not where they are. Um, so I think... Probably if you asked all of them, they want to get where the action is, you know, and that's L.A., that's New York, that's San Francisco. And again, with Cody and Alex in San Francisco, well, it, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? It's just a no-brainer. Um, when that happens, how that happens, I don't know, you know. I have no fucking idea, really. I talk to Alex every couple weeks these days, and that's about it. So, um, I don't know, you know. We'll see what they do. Well, I think that's a, a good kind of final wrap on, uh, on the evil geniuses part of it. So we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll kind of close out the show and, and ask Scoot some more general questions just about esports production. Cool. Uh, probably hit on a couple other games out there in different titles. So do not go anywhere. We've got more Real Talk with Scoots coming up in just a little bit. 